Hi everyone, I'm super excited to be here and I, I promise I won't take long, but I just wanted to share a little bit about why American Savings Bank um, invests the, the time and the resources to do the sponsorship for the UH Business Plan competition every other year. And really it's because it's important for Hawaii and we want to support you. So if there's anything that our president and CEO hates, it's when he hears that an entrepreneur has to move to the mainland because they don't have the resources that they need to get their idea up and running here. He really hates that. So um, as a bank, we're actually limited in how we can um, fund startups. And at the next boot camp, you're going to hear from a couple of my awesome teammates. We're going to share a little bit more with you on how to finance your business. But what we can do is we can make sure that we are promoting the healthy development of the entrepreneur and the innovation ecosystem. So that's why we do things like support space and business plan competitions and do everything else that we can as a company to make sure that the resources are available to those folks who really um, want to be able to uh, start up their own business. And you know, ultimately, we feel like the rising tide lifts all boats and we will all benefit, so we recognize that also it's kind of a long-term play, right? So um, super excited to see you guys. Um, I would say just make sure that you take advantage of the many mentors and awesome, truly top-notch resources that are available to you as you go through, for those of you who are doing a business plan competition, businesses pay big bucks to have access to this uh, kind of knowledge. So. Look forward to seeing what you guys come up with and uh, hopefully see you at the finals in April. So, thanks again. I'm here. Uh, I haven't mentioned before, I don't recognize most of you, I think. <clears throat> so, when we started the, we had the information session not too long ago. I said I was going to be super excited for this is my competition. I'm kind of continuing that theme. And what I'm going to talk about first. James is going to talk about the really important how to do stuff. I'm just going to sort of, you know, talk at such a high level that's going to sound hopefully a little bit interesting, but not that useful. <laughs> but we're going to talk about what investors look for. So why are we talking about investors? We're talking about doing this is my competition. That doesn't seem to make much sense. So I would propose that the same posture that judges will have in a business plan competition are the ones that investors would have if you were trying to raise outside funding. So they're going to have that same mindset. They're going to be thinking about your business in the same way. And so you might right now just be an idea on a draft and a napkin, or even just a you know a germ of an idea in your head at this stage, and you think, well, why would I even talk to investors? And yes, it's true that you might not be ready, but here we're going to talk through what they're going to want to see from you. And, and I quite certain that the judges, since I know many of the judges we've had in the past, and many of them are investors, but they can't not put their investor hat on. So when they hear about your business, that's pretty much the only way they're going to look at it. So you work really hard on writing a business plan and making it beautiful, and they're still going to look at it from a standpoint of, well, is this something that I would put my own money in? So let's talk about some of the things. Okay. So this is what we're doing here at Kids, right? We're, we're trying to maybe not so subtly brainwash you all and make you want to more. So we think that that's the answer to all life problems, all of those problems. There's, if you think about entrepreneurial mindset and entrepreneurial action, those are two different things. You might be able to come up with great ideas. And you and, and you might be very innovative and creative and so forth, but you have to get out there and start doing something as well and start making mistakes. So the business plan competition is a chance for you to push in the areas that might be uncomfortable for you. And you're worried to help you along the long way. So some of these slides I know are going to come up again in case presentation, but uh, I'm going to use it for my own purposes. So first of all, not to disappoint any of you, but you don't have a business. I guarantee that none of you have, actually I shouldn't say that because probably someone's going to say, hey, I already have a product and I'm selling it, I'm making money. And yeah, so then you do have a business. But <laughs> in general, 
if you're starting out now, you're not a business, you're not a small business. So this is my argument against business plans, which is weird because we're running a business plan competition, I understand, but you know, a business plan is really useful. Planning is important, right? I'm sure there's a lot of planning in the back. And the planning part is important, but the plan itself, the written plan itself, is not that important. Because as Steve Blank likes to say that it doesn't survive first contact with, with customers. It's kind of like a battle plan. You know, you think about a, one of your favorite war movies, you know, the, they do all this planning and then they go and all hell breaks loose, right? And nothing goes the way they plan. So think about the small business just as a, a search for a business model that might work and that might ultimately go into the end business. And if you think about your startup that way, it becomes easier to sort out things that are really important and things that are not important. So some of the not important things might be going out and getting a business license. It, it might even be you know, coming up with a name for the company. Maybe that's not that important. You're not solving problems you will need to solve. So focus on the things that you focus on the things that investors are looking for, ultimately down the road, whoever they may be. Maybe it'll position you better, the business better. And you'll be further along and you're more likely to win a business plan competition along the way. That's like a mess. So there's six things, six categories that I think investors are going to look for. And these are the things that you should spend a lot of time thinking about and become experts on if you can. So that's another thing the judges are going to look for. <clears throat> do these people know more about the business than I do? I do. You know, I've been a judge for a long time in a bunch of different plans, and I used to take this approach of trying to find the weak spots, and you know, and then kind of like look how smart I am. I picked out this crack in your armor and I'm exploiting it. And uh, I try not to do that anymore. I try to think more big picture. But you do have to be ready for those types of people because it's easier to be critical of something than it is to be supportive of something. So make sure that you know more about these areas than, than any of the judges. So the first is the market. So this should be somewhat intuitive. The market should be attractive. The market represents how, in a way, it represents the problem that exists out there that you're supposed to solve. So the bigger that problem is, if you have a good solution for it, maybe the more attractive that market is. So what would we look for? We look for something big, something growing, maybe something re relatively undefined, you know, an unexploited piece of the market. And you have to show us as judges why your solution can exploit that that weakness in the market or that gap in the market. So why is it important to be big? Can anyone think of why it's important to be smart? <coughs> or growing? Let's think about growing. You have more people to play with. Pardon? You have more people to play with. That's right. So if the market is the same size, it is, it is fixed, and there's other providers in the market that you're competing with, then that means that all the dollars are accounted for. Yeah. And so you have to get people to, to switch from them. But if your market's growing, then those people are going to come in and see your product and things like that type of thing. Right, there's new people coming into the market and they might be willing to try a new product. So that's exactly right. So there's this debate about this among venture capitalists. The venture capitalists form an investor. Most of you are probably not even close to being ready for venture capital and maybe never will. And if you don't need them, I would say stay away from them because it's a difficult group. So Tom Downtime invested in Apple, he invested in Atari. Sequoia also was a, the um, lead investor in Google. So this is a very storied firm. This is just called Give Me a Giant Market. It's only looking for a giant market. That's how important it is to have a market opportunity that's attractive. So how do you fit that in if you're trying to start a lifestyle business that caters to some unique local advantage in Hawaii because that maybe that's not such a big market. Do you think you can does that mean that you're not a good it's not a good business? Now, I, 
the size of the market is, is, is really relative to the, you know, the, the strength of your solution. So if you could figure out a way to dominate a niche market, then that is also a giant market. Don might not invest in you because he, he might have to go, he might have to be thinking of the next Google. But there's plenty of other investors out there that will. And if you build something of real value, you know, the bank will too. So, so think about the market that way. Don't be scared if you can't, you know, put a B after the dollar sign, you know, after the numbers are in the size of your market, meaning it's not in the business. That's okay. But you still have to figure out how you can be the dominant player. Does that make sense? Okay. So then next, we have team. The thing that pops into my head, in fact, yesterday I was at that White Angels lunch. I know some of, some of you were there too. And this happened yesterday where if the idea seems even remotely interesting, the next thing I'm immediately analyzing is, is this the right team to do it? I actually have, have a new very impressive team that presented yesterday. I like the team more than I like the business detail. But uh, by this argument, I should be investing in that. So Arthur Rock, who's also a storied investor, you know, he also invested in Apple. These guys all invest together. So sometimes they're, you know, their claim to fame is all the same. So he says, find a good entrepreneur like yourselves and back them. It doesn't matter what they're doing now. Even if this thing they're doing now doesn't work, they'll figure it out and they'll either make it work by shifting it you buy pivoting in the market, or it'll fail, and the next thing. And that's what I think we're doing at Pace here. I'm not, not to say that we want you all to fail, we want you all to be successful, but I think, generally speaking, we're just backing great entrepreneurs who are going to fail, but the next time they're not going to fail, or the time after that. So we're going to keep providing support to you on your entrepreneurial journey, which is going to involve, sadly, a lot of failure it just is. I, I, I can speak from my own personal experience, but my failures far out of way any success that I have. And if you're lucky, you know, the thing that you're successful over, ends up overshadowing all the failures. And uh, I, I tell you from my personal experience, I worked for 10 years for a company. I was starting a business with them. It's amazing that they didn't fire me, you know, every six months for all the things that projects that we started that failed and all the money we wasted. I'm not joking. We started 30 different businesses. We invested in 20 or 30 different businesses. And most of them were a terrible failure. And some of them really, we just really missed completely what was going on and spent a lot of the, company, the shareholders' money during that. However, a couple of things, one thing was particularly successful and it ended up helping the business grow tremendously. You know, by 50 or 100 times. And so it just happens that that's all they remember. They only remember that one thing because that one thing paid for all of Peter's failures and more, right? So that's kind of the way you want to approach failure. That you're, you know, if you're looking for that one success to overshadow all the failures. So what happens in with startups? And investors, you often see them backing people that you know. You might say, well, that, that guy's lot, that person's lost company went out of business. They lost a lot of money. Why is he investing in them again? Well, it's because of this backing the great entrepreneur. So what does that mean for you? Well, you, you need to articulate why you're the right team to be in a business. So if you have if you have uh, proprietary expertise in the field. Bring that to the front of, the, of your of your plan. So tell tell the judges, tell us how why you're an expert in the field, why you're the only one. I might be exaggerating, but you're the only one that can pull this off, or your team is so uniquely qualified. What happens if your team's not uniquely qualified? <clears throat> you just had a good idea and you went for it. Well, there's a I, I joke with entrepreneurs when they're presented to investors because you know there's. There's sort of standard 10 slides for you for an investor yeah. pitch deck, and one of them is the team. And I say, if you're the, if, if you're uniquely qualified as a team, put on a team slide first, 
another one put it in the, in the back. Right, so the tire, the last slide. Thing, tire out and you know we'll be done for it. Okay. But that's somewhat cynical. You know, I think if your team isn't meaningfully qualified, then you should identify what do you need to make to make this work. So maybe in order to make your business work, you need some set of expertise. And so what you should present in your plan is you know what you need to the people that you need to recruit to make that team great. Okay. So you know if you I guess a very simple example would be if you know if you don't have a lot of business experience but you're doing a technology a very technical project and you don't have a technology oriented person on the team, that's going to be an obvious weakness that shows up. So you, so show us your plan okay. to fill that hole. And that would be and then otherwise put the team slide on that. Okay, so now we have a product. I didn't have a good, really good quote for this, but I always leave it in here because it, I, I, it reminds me to tell a personal story about my failure as an entrepreneur. And generally speaking, your product has to, you know, we here, in, for you, those of you at China, we're always talking about, in every class you take, we're talking about differentiation, differentiation, differentiation. What makes your product uh, better, cheaper, faster, whatever. So I think you're pretty set on that, right? You, you don't necessarily have to be doing something that's new, that's never been done before. But if you're doing something that people are already doing out there, you can't just be just like them. That's a, that won't impress the judges. There has to be something about it that's different. But I don't think it's as important as the other two. It's weird. You think it's the most important thing. I think idea is the most important thing. And of these three, it's the least important thing. So, the judges will definitely be more, investors will be more attracted to a large market opportunity because they figure that they'll be with a lot of room to mess up a bunch of times. <clears throat> and they'll be more attracted to the, a strong team that they feel that could weather that kind of failure. And your product, you know, you're going to figure that out along the way. So you do still need to do the differentiation and show why you're different. But it's not as important as the other things. So this is a terrible quote from Fred Wilson at Union Square Ventures. But he's the, you know, for the last two years, he's been the number one venture capital investor in the United States, maybe the world. That, so it's weird. They do kind of like deep tables. So they keep track of investors and what companies they pick and how they do, whether they, you know, so uh, Postmates just thought they go public, or Lyft just thought they go public. So I think he's an investor in Uber, but, you know, if he's been an investor in one of those, when they went public, that would have counted in, you know, he would have gotten a big return for his investors and that's count towards his score. So he's very successful. This is a lean startup. He's talking about the lead startup here when he talks about product ownership. He's talking about finding a strong match between the problem that exists out there and the solution out there. For most of you, I'm sorry, you probably heard my point star story about Jens Wilmot, right? Yeah? No? Okay. No. <laughs> Good. You talk to your audience. <laughs> They've turned like a hundred times now in the last five years. But I don't think I can tell this. Yeah. Let's see this. <laughs> So Jens founded Coinstar while he was a business student at Stanford in, in the business school. In fact, the company, the first check from the first investor, which was the founder of a big grocery store chain in the Northwest, was written to something called, it was called Sky, Skybox LLC or something, because that's where they sat up in the stadium. It was like the worst seats in the stadium at Stanford. And uh, he presented the idea in a business class and the reason he came up with the idea is because he worked for his parents' garden center called Mulbax, which is in Woodville, Washington. It's actually a locally quite well known place. You go there on the weekends, you know, just take the family out there and go shopping for new tree. And he worked there. He, it was his grandparents' business. He worked there as a kid washing flower pots. He got paid a penny a pot to wash the flower pots. So he accumulated a lot of change as a kid. And he did what I did. 
we carried it around with them for years. For some reason, just the coin jar always goes with me, you know. And maybe I lived there for many years in New York, so I used to figure out all the quarters, quarters so I could get my laundry, or well, pay the parking meters. So it was just mostly in nickels, dimes, and pennies. But it was a lot of money. And he took him to the East Coast to go to college, and then back to the West Coast, and then to California. And he started thinking about, well, this is stupid. Maybe if I could turn this into some value somehow, that, that would be a good business idea. So he pitched the idea of the coin star machine in class, and everyone thought it was a stupid idea. It is a really stupid idea. I think about it. You're just, I, I have this idea. I want to turn your money into your money, and you're going to pay me a fee for I'm sorry, I guess that's kind of offensive, but. <laughs> but uh, actually, the reason that the coin star machine worked partly was because banks didn't really want you to bring change in there, because that wasn't that wasn't a profitable activity for a bank in those banks. So even though most of you think that that's from cash your coins for you, because when you were a kid, that's what you did. They don't really want it. Uh, so it didn't go well in, in, in business class. <clears throat> so he went and stood in front of the Safeway in Palo Alto, which is still there. This would have been, I think, 1989. And he, he interviewed 1,500 people. He and his ex-wife, who was his girlfriend at the time, they stood there and they split this up for a week. They interviewed 1,500 people. And they asked them, first, if they, if they have the problem that he had, he had. So, do you, do you have coins at home in a jar, in your ashtray, in, your, in the, you know, wedges in your couch? And everybody does. So even though that seems obvious, it's worth asking because if you have a problem that you think you're trying to solve, if it, if it came up from a personal problem, you want to make sure that, it, that you're not sample of one. It could be a lot of my ideas, it turns out, I'm the only one that cares about this. Right? It seems like I'm the only person on earth that doesn't like cold for example. <laughs> so, there's no business in not liking cold for So, So he interviewed 1,500 people and they, in fact, confirmed that he had this problem or that they had this problem. And then on top of that, he asked them, would you pay to bring, if you could bring your coins to the grocery store and turn, them in, turn your money into your money? In? And, most of them said yes. So in spite of not being able to find anyone to support his business, he found customers who were, were willing to support his business. This is a lean startup story. So then he jacked up his credit card and built a prototype for $25,000 with his own money, his own debt, not even his own money, and, uh, and put it in that store. And that store hasn't had, has not had a coin store machine for, except for two years when Safeway kicked all of our machines out because of the controversy that we had with them. But except for two years since 1989, there's been a coin star machine in there just, you know, a time money. And that's because he asked. So this product market fit thing he's talking about is very, very important. Isn't that just market research and the grit of an entrepreneur, though? It is. It is. But you can be gritty. <clears throat> and not be lean. So you can be, you can persist in your business without asking anybody for feedback, without asking for customers. I don't, I feel like all, all products in your business file, you need market research, you need like clients, you need, a, you need to show that you have a market, and that's how you like back up that you have a market. So it's like, I don't disagree with you. Research. Absolutely right. You can do, I guess. The difference between building a lean startup and building a startup in, in the old fashioned way, but you can do this research from a top-down basis. Yeah. You can look it up, right? We could come up with a business in this room right now and probably create a pretty good plan for it. But there, you know, the 40 of us, or however many are there in here, that's not we don't represent the market. No. And so we have to you have to go out to the market and talk to it. Why is why did you say that that was a terrible quote though? I'm not I'm not quite. Understanding. Oh, I just mean it's long and I don't want to you know. <laughs> okay, I was it was in there because I, I got shot down twice by Fred Wilson and when I was in my Two different business ideas. <laughs> I wanted to tell you that, and that's why I was here. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, this is taking a little longer because I, I always digress, but let's talk about competition for a second. So first, get it out of your head that you have no competition. That's not true. Inertia is a kind of competition, meaning if we won't, if we just aren't buying your product because we're happy not having your product, you know, you have to, you have to convince us to buy your product, and so you're competing with us being at least. I would propose that you should turn it around and look at the competition a, a different way. Look at it as the competition validates that the market is real and that the market exists and it's worth being. So product differentiation and competition go together. You can see, you, you know, the more differentiated you are in a market where you have product market fit, the better you're going to do against your competitors. But the presence of competitors is a good thing in this context. So don't say, please, we don't have any competition. There's no competition. You do. There's three kinds of competition. There's direct competitors. Somewhere somebody is doing exactly what you're doing right now. They're having the same thoughts as you and pursuing the same opportunity. I promise it's seven billion people, most of whom, most of whom are entrepreneurial based in some way. So don't don't think that you don't have competition. Instead, Find them, study them, figure out how to be better than them, and tell us about them. Tell us as investors, tell us as judges, that you it shows that you understand this market really well, okay? So that's direct. Then you have indirect competitors, which are people that maybe they're not doing it the way you're doing it, but they're pretty much serving that market in some way. So if you have some newfangled travel product, and that's never been done before, you still have indirect competitors because there's a lot of people serving the travel the travelers, right? So just because they're not doing it the way you're doing it doesn't mean you have no competition. You do. Big competition. And then you have future competitors. So this don't overlook the fact that most of the wildly successful startups that we use, or not even startups anymore, companies that we use as examples of the proof that this is all possible, none of them were first. Google wasn't first in search. In years after the internet, had really built a big search business. Right? Facebook wasn't first. Google wasn't first. None of these companies were first. So it might be more important to be in a growing market with vibrant competitors than to be in a growing market or a market that doesn't really seem to be competitive at all. Maybe if there's no competition, it's because nobody cares. See what I'm saying? Okay. So this quote has more to do with team than with competition, but I love it so much that I always put it in my presentations. Because this is what we want to see your team how we want you to work relative to competition. We want you to be like Will Smith. This is from the book written by Andrew Luckworth. She, she did a profile on him. We want to see that's the attitude we're going to have with respect to your competitors and the market. We know this is going to be hard. We just want to know that you're not going to give up. I love that quote. Fortunately, I don't have close for the next two, so go like that. So now, you have to have a business model that makes sense, and you have to think it through. So you don't have to present us necessarily with a five-year projection and detailed financial statements, most of which are wrong. A venture capitalist is very well known and is a mentor to Pete. I heard him say this thing, and I'll repeat it. He built this, he built this beautiful financial model. Spent hours and hours building it, and he said, I guarantee every single cell in that Excel spreadsheet is wrong. Every single number is wrong. Because it's just a projection. So the most important part you have to work out is the, sim is, is the simple math of how you make money. So you sell one of something, how much does it cost you to get that to the customer, and how much does the customer pay you for it, and is there money left over? in that scenario, and it cannot be repeated more than once. And then you have 
a validated financial model. <clears throat> and the last thing, which is a little bit probably not, not as important for the business plan competition, but it is important for your business, is we want we want to see a way to make a return. So a judge will look at it and say, if I invest in this, do I believe that I can make 10 times my money on this investment? And that seems like a lot. It seems like we're being greedy, but we're also talking, we're thinking that first, most of the things we invest in won't work out. So the ones that do have to pay for all the others. And then the other thing we're thinking about is we're probably not going to see a return for seven or 10 years. And so a 10, a 10 times return over that period doesn't actually work out to be as big as you know, it looks like this. So that means that if you are asking someone to give you $50,000, then you you have to show them how they can make $500,000. And if your business doesn't scale that way, then you might not be ready for an investor like this. And, you, and so you have to think about other ways to finance the business. So again, it's not necessarily as germane to the business by competition, but I think it's important to think about it, since, since they're going to have an investor hat on, they're going to think, would I write a check for this? And part of their thinking is, am I getting, am I investing in something that looks like it? And then the big one, the last one is traction. So what is traction? Well, well I'll give you some examples of traction in a second, but traction is what it sounds like. You know, most of you don't probably know the experience of spinning your tires on ice, but you know, there's a big snowstorm in Seattle going on right now, and they know, you know, traction is when your tires start to catch and push the, the vehicle forward. And that, that's what we're looking for in your business. What, what kind of evidence of traction do you have? So that could be a wide range of things. It could be you, you, you already have customers. Or it could be that you've gone out and you've talked to 100 potential customers, and 80% of them have told you, that they would buy this product and create it. That's traction too. So you can get traction even if you're really on the napkin stage in the business. Okay. Peter, would you say um, traction would also include having a competitor who's who's made it work? Like is that sort of validation of the business model in that sense? Or I mean it can be. Yeah, I mean that's evidence that there's a reason to do what you're doing, I suppose. But I would rather see that you know the traction be related to your business in the marketplace. So I'll give you a list of things that constitute traction. But, and I know I think you have the slide also. Yeah. But so this is a uh, CB Insights is a resource for about startups and and they track the reason startups fail and. The number one reason is no market need. And you think about how dumb that is, that most companies fail because of no market need. It seems like, oh yeah, well it turns out the market didn't really want the product. Well, why did you build it? Why did you build it? All you had to do is ask customers and they would tell you whether the market needs the product. So if you said, well, we went out and asked everybody and they all said no, and we built it anyway, I would, I would appreciate that more, <laughs> because at least you asked. But most of companies are failing because they're not even bothering to ask the market what it wants. And you don't have to do that. So don't try to go after this competition with this insular idea that, you, that you're going to do it without testing the market right now. There's no reason why you, won't, why you can't test the market right now. Every one of you can go out and talk to 100 people who you think might be customers and get their input on it. And you validate or invalidate what you're doing. That would be good. So traction is strong forward momentum. That's higher in the snow in Seattle, I guess. So here's a couple types of traction for you at an early stage. It can take a wide range of forms. One that I, I left off, but I just mentioned before, is 
customer evidence from interviews. So remember the ex Mulbach story. He probably was successful because he did those interviews. Because if he hadn't done the interviews, either he wouldn't have built a business, or he would have built the business in the wrong way. Or he would have given up most of the company to other investors, because he was very good at fundraising. He, he would have eventually given up most of the company to other investors. But he was able to keep most of the company because he did the investment discovery interviews. So I think most of you probably are thinking about which ones, which of these things we have right now, and how can we position them as traction. And that's the way you should be thinking about it when you make the presentation. So let's put pull this all together and we'll get out of here. So we can order these things by importance now. Traction is the first. I've seen people who hate the business side of it, just hate it. Even aren't happy with the people, but I've seen them invest in the business because the traction was there. Put them all out. Since you can see that I've sized these fonts to emphasize what's most important towards what's the least important. It's kind of weird, it should strike me as kind of weird that you're going to put all this effort into trying to win this business plan competition, which constitutes writing a business plan and making a presentation, which I'm telling you now are the least important things. <clears throat> so that isn't a license for you to do a sloppy job on this. Just to make sure that we're still going to read it and we're still going to be critical of it. Particularly if you don't need spell check. <laughs> But in terms of the importance to the judges and to the investors, nobody cares about that stuff. They care about traction and in the market, and then they care about the metal. So when you're pitching, if you were to just start with traction, would that build like you have good traction? You had already clients and whatnot, would that build um, like, oh, like for the investors to feel like, oh, like what is this product that she already has this kind of traction? Yes. So starting with traction is a good place to start. Starting with traction or maybe showing the traction that you have in each area that you discuss. So, you know, if you're talking about the market, what kind of traction you have in the market, if you're talking about the team, traction might be the qualifications of that team to serve that market, right? If you're talking about the product, it might be the fact that you've already built a minimum viable product or a prototype that you can use, you know, that you're already putting in front of customers. Okay. So everything that you've done, everything can be tracked, every step you make. And the great thing about where you are is that each thing that you do adds so much value to the business. You can never add more value on a percentage basis to, to, a, to a company. The way you can now at this early stage. Think about it. If you write a business plan, that's a huge step towards pursuing your business, and it makes your business more valuable. Maybe twice or three times more valuable. Right? If you go out and talk to 100 customers and maybe find one that agrees that they'll be a pilot customer for you, that is going to make the business double in value or triple in value again. You, you don't get to do that. Later, it's harder because. Later, when you have a big organization, getting one more customer, it doesn't add that much to the business in value. But, so now you can add a lot of value. So yeah, focus on the traction throughout. 